Lord, we thank you for this day you bless us with. We ask that you guide us and keep us safe. We ask that you still continue to keep our troops safe overseas. Lord, we ask that you uh, stay with us throughout this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Any additions or corrections? If so, they'll stand approved. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those same sign. Is uh, the Claremore Service Unit. Uh, George is not with us today. I believe his report is inside. Any discussion on his report? <coughs> Could we uh, request, I'm sorry, madam. Yes. Could we request he to uh, supply a Zoom or something for the next meeting? Because it's been a long time since we've actually seen or heard from George directly. That would be wonderful. Uh, Shelly, would you extend an invitation to do a Zoom meeting with us? I will. Thank you so much. Uh, did I miss anyone on that? Okay, next up we have Dr. Steve Jones, Cherokee Nation Health Services. Good morning, Dr. Jones. Good morning. How are you today? I'm doing good. Um, I'll start off and just uh, go through a couple of the uh, highlights on our committee report. Uh, some of the things that we normally highlight last week and the last month, we didn't talk about this much. We had a lot of catching up to do on the uh, COVID update. So just bring your attention to our vacancy rate uh, at 3.4%. That's something that we can kind of follow. Uh, and I'll run through these pretty quickly. Um, the approval rate on our uh, Contract sales or uh, purchase referred care is 97.3%. Even uh, throughout all this um, adjustments that we've made and staffing issues that we dealt with, we're still maintaining a high level of approval rates there. Um, on the next page, you'll see that our third party revenues have, we're a little bit behind, which we would anticipate that currently. Uh, but we're not as far behind as, as you might think with all the uh, reduced services that we've had. We're just uh, a little less than a million behind. And as, as most of you know, or all of you should know, that uh, all the third-party revenues are um, budgeted or allocated into our services each year. So uh, we're, we're in keeping track of that, making sure that we're staying on track and we're doing uh, some catching up, but uh, we're a lot less behind than you would think at this point in time. Uh, if you look at the next, the next uh, page, you'll see that our left without being seen rate is uh, probably at an all, you know, a pretty low rate. I don't know if that's an all-time low, but it's stayed consistently low, even though our urgent care is and ED are very busy right now. So uh, that's a tribute to, to the staff that's working in that area. And then the last part of that report is uh, our quarterly, every quarter, or every quarter we change up a little bit on what we report in the end, and it's uh, diagnosis by each clinic. I think someone had requested that, so we have this turn is to have those diagnoses available. So um, with that, I'm going to move on to some things that are more relevant, to, or not more relevant, I guess are relevant to what's going on in the immediate future, immediate time since we talked last. Um, just going to give you a brief history on, the, on where we were at with the COVID report. Um, cases continue to climb across Oklahoma. I know that the, that stuff has been in the news, and obviously, uh, you've got to watch the news and see that. Um, currently in Oklahoma, we're at 25,000 plus cases. Um, currently in Cherokee Nation, within our health system, we've had 506 cases. 
positive cases um, and around 9,000 cases within our boundaries when you include Tulsa County. So uh, we're doing pretty well. Uh, we've done a good, I feel like we've done a really good job getting the message out about wearing masks and uh, social distancing and, and hand hygiene and things of that nature. So uh, 506 is a lot of cases. And I'd say that probably half of those have come in, in the month of July. Um, but, uh, but it's pretty low considering the number of people that we serve. Uh, we're continuing to watch hospitalization, and that's kind of a key metric for us, watching those across the state in our area and uh, here at Hastings. So right now, we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, the last census that I saw this morning, about a little less than half of our inpatients are COVID-related. Uh, with those numbers increasing, that's, that's increased a little bit, but not to the, to the point that we're concerned, uh, very, very concerned about at this point. We have the capacity to double our, our inpatients, so uh, we haven't had to go into any of those measures as of yet, but we are tracking that very closely. Uh, we get a, a supervisor, house supervisor, of course, the time, uh, each 24 hours, so we're watching that. Um, Testing, we've done about 10,500 tests as of Sunday, as of Friday. That was what last testing report I've got. Um, the biggest amount of positives of those 506 are between the ages of 18 and 49. Over half of our cases are in that age group. Um, so we're seeing a lot of uh, increase in, in that, I think that's the same trend we're seeing across the nation, across the state. Uh, we've had five deaths in our Cherokee Nation health system as far as people that we've tracked uh, since the beginning of this. Um, the state in, within our boundaries has had 115 deaths. So uh, we've, done, we've done well there. Any death is, is a terrible tragedy, but uh, considering the numbers and the positives in our area and, and across our state, um, it looks like that uh, we're doing a good job of catching it and, and getting people uh, services that they needed as quickly as we can. Uh, our health task force continues to meet and keep everybody informed throughout all of our different departments. Um, we're working on opening up our testing capacity even more as our inventory has grown. Um, we've been able to get uh, more testing supplies through the avenues that have been opened up to us through IHS and through private uh, sectors. So uh, as we've done that, we've increased our testing capacity. The issue with also with testing is we also have to do the tracing and we have to do the case monitoring, so we've had to beef up those areas also. Uh, and that's something that we've worked on continuously. Um, several of our people are staying at, uh, informed on all the latest research with testing and all the latest treatments. We do offer remdesivir if, if uh, we do have a patient that meets those needs. We have those uh, drugs available through our uh, hospitals, so we are we do have patients that are being treated currently and have been treated with that uh, medication. Um, that does skew a little bit of our hospitalization numbers because it does require five days stay in the hospital when you take that medication. So we may have someone recovering, but they have to stay in the hospital for a minimum of five days. So that does skew our numbers just a little bit on on, uh, on our COVID-related numbers. We've stayed. Um, uh, getting supplies for our employees and for uh, um, people coming into our facilities, uh, PPE. Um, we've offered testing to all of our employees as, they come, as we brought them back to work, as we phased in. About 70% of our employees have taken advantage of that. Um, we're still doing a lot of internal um, marketing, I guess, or uh, persuasive. Uh, advertising uh, uh, to try to get that other 30 percent to go ahead and test. Uh, we don't have it mandatory. It's just an optional offering to uh, any employee that's coming back that's been on administrative leave or has been out uh, that is coming back to work. Um, Public Health has been working on getting some information put together for schools as they're getting closer to opening uh, and working through the CDC guidelines to come up with uh, metrics to help them decide you know, what their approach needs to be. And again, we're not trying to dictate or tell schools what they should or shouldn't do. 
but we're trying to give them the information so they can make uh, their leadership to make the best uh, decision that they possibly can. Uh, we have, with the increased number of uh, cases across Cherokee Nation and across the state, we have rolled back our phased approach. Uh, we have not moved on to our next phase, and we have, um, as of last week, we decided to not open dental services up uh, other than just acute care for another uh, two weeks, and we'll look at that again and see where our cases are after that. Um, a lot of the folks in dental that we've been using, we've been utilizing them in, in the case monitoring team. So um, there's there's still needing help in that area. We have those numbers have not declined; they've increased. So uh, we feel like that's a better use of those folks at this point in time. They're still open for emergency services, as I said, but uh, we're not starting a routine care uh, yet. So, uh, <coughs> like I said earlier, our, our Purchase for first care has stayed uh, <coughs> pumped. We've done a good job of keeping our staff uh, as close to uh, up to date as we can and keeping our numbers uh, so the delays aren't there, even though we've had reduced staff. Um, we've made a lot of uh, permanent revisions to our facilities or in the process of making permanent revisions uh, to protect our staff. Uh, we're installing uh, what we call barriers or sneeze guards that a lot of our locations that we didn't have them before uh, just to protect our staff as they deal with the public and as, as, they, uh, as more people come in. Um, contact tracing, we're currently uh, following 387 cases and then in case monitoring we're following 376 cases currently. So uh, as we find a positive case we go back and uh, public health is, is working to trace those back to see who else might be exposed and then once we have a positive case case monitoring comes in and, and they will follow certain cases uh, making contact with them each day to uh, follow the progress and give them recommendations if they need to uh, go ahead and come in for treatment or if they just need to continue to monitor self-monitor at home um, despite all these challenges and all these uh, constant changes that we've had to go under and some, sometimes we make changes within 24 hours. The CDC will come out with a uh, recommendation one day and the next day changes. So uh, we've had to constantly train, constantly update, constantly um, be flexible on how we uh, treat our patients and how we uh, work with one another in, in our social distancing and the, the way that we, we uh, try to keep everybody as safe as we possibly can. Uh, despite all those changes and all the stress that, that goes along with this pandemic that we're in, the staff has continued to do a, a fantastic job. They've been flexible, uh, the attitudes have been great, um, everyone's working for, you know, toward the same goal. We've had a few hiccups here and there, we've had some weather issues with our drive throughs we've had uh, a lot of challenges to overcome. The staff has just been fantastic at uh, being flexible and being able to uh, make changes on the fly and, and uh, do everything we've asked them to do. Uh, a few other highlights that I'd like to highlight. Uh, medical school students are, are coming on campus now. We had the uh, delay in construction. We made some accommodations here at the outpatient center to uh, house those students until the uh, completion of their uh, area that they'll be moving into in their new building. Um, NSU PA school has gotten their accreditation and they'll be starting a class in the fall. We do we will be working with them some to uh, for rotations next year as they get closer to the rotation time. Um, family practice residence, we took over the family practice residency program at OSU uh, and, NS, and NHS they've had before. Uh, those residents are on campus and they started in on June twenty second. And then one more highlight that I, uh, thing that I want to remind that I talked about last time is we will be closing the refill center for four weeks as we move it from the Skokie to uh, the TEC building uh, where we can expand it. Uh, we'll be turning that space into um, patient care that, where it was located in, in the Skokie. So that refill center will be down for four weeks. We've made accommodations that every pharmacy and now all of our facilities will be taking over those duties. So the patients should not see any kind of fall off in services, but 
Uh, we are expecting them to move the, the robotics and the uh, lines to Alpha. So uh, if you do hear that, that is true. We are shutting it down, but we've made all accommodations to make sure the patients don't see a, a fall off in their prescriptions. And with that, I, that's uh, kind of a fast <coughs> run of all the things going on, but uh, I'll take any questions. Dr. Jones, it sure sounds like you all are been, have been very busy. Councilor Crittenton. Yeah, Doc, thank you for uh, answering a couple of phone calls and always being available. Hey, it seems when I first started hearing about COVID that it was ventilator, ventilator, ventilator. And it seems like now I don't hear of the ventilator so often in, in the health world that you're around every day. Is that true or is my observation off a little bit? Uh, we haven't seen the, the uh, we've had, I think we've only had one ventilator in use uh, in, in our facility. We haven't seen that be a shortage uh, currently. Uh, I don't know the, the reason is that, you know, that we're doing, a, I think a lot of it has to do with doing a better job. Those who are most vulnerable are probably uh, spending the most, taking the precautions more seriously. So they're staying uh, in, out of harm's way. Uh, like I said, the numbers have shown that the 18 to 49 year, year, uh, year olds that are the most infected at this point in time, uh, but we haven't seen the ventilators as a huge um, obstacle at, at, for us anyway, or in this part of the state. Thank you, ma'am. Council Leg. <laughs> Dr. Jones, uh, I have an elder in Salisaw that was enrolled in the marketplace insurance. Uh, December 9th, 2018, uh, the uh, clinical social worker uh, or patient advocate, uh, they canceled that policy. And then they, the marketplace automatically enrolled her into 1920. Now the IRS is coming after her for $11,000. Is there any assistance we can, I'm not saying you know, we write a check for $11,000, but do we have anybody that can help her with her appeals to the IRS <coughs> on this issue? We've had some similar situations that have come up before on, on uh, things of that nature. If you'll just send me an email, that person's name and a contact, I'll get them in contact with some uh, the folks that have helped uh, some of our other um, citizens that have had similar issues. Uh, I think what that comes down to is a benefit and taking the cash value of a benefit and then knowing the taxes on that benefit. So uh, we have been able to help a few people that have run across that same issue. So if you'll just send that to me, I'll, I'll uh, get someone to reach out to thank you that reached out and help the other citizens. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> yes, Councillor Shamba. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, is our home health still going into uh, residences and taking uh, care of patients? I can't answer that, uh, Councilor Shambaugh. Home Health doesn't fall under me. Um, home Health is its own agency. They have their own, uh, they're, we're affiliated with them, but they don't fall under me because I don't know what protocols they're using currently. Who would I ask? Um, who would, who would I find that information from? Um, uh, well, I'll have to get you the number of the, the name and number of the person who is the uh, director of the home health. Uh, I think they come and report to you guys once a quarter, uh, home health, hospice, and faith. But they all fall, they don't fall under uh, our purview. Now, we do have public health nursing uh, that does fall under our purview, and they do uh, go out to the homes. Uh, in some cases, we have sent them out to do some testing. We have sent them out for wound care, and, and we are constantly. Uh, we've done a lot of training on, on PPE and appropriate um, measures that we take when we do go into the home. Could you give me that number today? I have a constituent who has a question. Yeah, I'll, I'll get that to you. All right. Thanks, sir. Yes, Chief of Staff Inlow. Um, Dr. Jones and uh, Councillor Chambal. Um, Councillor, I'll send you a text message as I sit down. So Dr. Jones, don't worry about it. Uh, but it is my understanding they are still going into homes. 
Um, we've supplied PPE to some of their staff uh, to help them go into the hunt because they weren't adequately supplied with PPE in the beginning. Um, but I'll send you that contact so you can contact them. Do you know if they are performing the same duties that they have performed in the past or they have they cut that back from since, you know, they dressed wounds, they treated wounds, they bathed, they changed sheets. Do you have any idea if they're still doing things like that? I would assume that they are on restricted uh, services. Uh, they're not doing the full gamut of what they used to do in the past, but uh, let's, I'll send you that contact in this more and we'll confirm that to me. Right. Thanks, sir. Yes, Councilor Buzzard? Yes, Dr. Jones, I just, uh, I've had several calls about dental dental appointments and I'm wondering you know we don't know how long this is going to go on and I do understand that you're seeing emergencies or the dental departments are seeing emergencies but these people call and have appointments for the last six months and they're getting canceled rescheduled and getting canceled again have you ever thought about uh, having those patients go take a, a, a test and then before their appointments are due to ensure the dentist that they don't have the disease. Have we looked into something like that? Because I don't think we can put this off forever. I know I see a lot of uh, private dentists, they're open. I don't know how they're doing it, but I just got to thinking, you know, there's some way we've got to do something because if a dental patient is willing to go take a test, then go see the dentist, that gives some assurance to the dentist to go ahead and see that patient. But that's just a thought, you know, something we need to think about, for you to think about, and some of the health department people to think about. But uh, anyway, I just want to bring that to your attention to see if there's something we could work out, because this has been going on now, what, four to five months, and people are really needing to see the dentist for their appointments. So anyway, that's just an idea. So uh, part of the time we were shut down is because the Oklahoma Board of Dentistry uh, mandated that all dentistry stop except for emergency care. And then once we did that, we uh, once it reopened and it was opened up in a phased approach, we started looking at how we can open up. Uh, there are some specific um, guidance that comes out uh, for dentistry from CDC because of the aerosols that are created. So within dentistry, about um, you know. 85% of our of the work that's done in dentistry is our procedurals, our procedures that are done. Uh, of those procedures, most of them, 90% of the procedures that are done, extractions and, and cleaning with hand instruments are probably the very most common that aren't, uh, that don't create aerosols. Everything else creates aerosols. So we have looked at it. We're looking at how we can be safest uh, to approach it. Uh, for our patients and for our staff. Uh, as you know, our dental clinics are wide open. There's not doors or there's not walls and doors between the different operatories so those aerosols can travel. Uh, so we have purchased and we are waiting on those to arrive. A, uh, a easiest way to explain it is a vacuum type system that will set right over the patient's mouth during the procedure and, and basically take in those aerosols, clean the air, and filter it and send it back out. So uh, we are purchasing those for every year. Uh, they should have started arriving this week, uh, last week actually, and, uh, and this week. And when those get here, they will start looking at reopening. Our plan was to open this week, uh, but with the rise in cases and the need for those personnel to help us with, on, with case management uh, and the assessment of how much PPE is going to require to get us open to uh, routine care and like we had planned on, we decided to postpone it for two more weeks and wait for the, those machines to get here so we can be as safe as we can for our patients and for our, our staff. Well, that, that's uh, good to hear. Yeah. I know you haven't addressed that in any of our meetings. You're not that employment. So I thought I'd bring this up and to make sure that, that you are looking at it. And it sounded to me like you are looking at it. Averages around 14 patients a day. Uh, so you're talking about approximately 28 to 30 sets of PPE per dentist per day that we're going to start utilizing as soon as we start reopening. And with all the increase in cases across the state, those supply chains have started to tighten up again. So we don't want to run into a situation where we start depleting our PPE that we need for uh, the most critical of care 
uh, to open up electric care. So that's why we kept it open to just emergency care uh, for another two weeks and then reassess where we're at and make sure that we have all the adequate measures in place to keep our, our patients and our, and our staff as safe as possible. Well, it's good to hear that, uh, that you're on top of that. You know, you hadn't reported that to the committee here, and I'm just wondering when it's going to get back opened up. So it sounds to me like you're on, on top of it, so I'm sure our citizens will appreciate it. The other thing I had is, uh, not, you may have said it in your report, is are you seeing an increase of children, uh, uh, kids under 18 years of age coming in for uh, this health reason? <coughs> Uh, that's not the biggest increase in numbers. Um, well, like I said, the biggest increase we've seen over half of our cases are between 18 and 49. Okay. Uh, let me, I can get you those, that breakdown. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll send that breakdown out to everyone. It, it'll break down just on the test that we have as positive, uh, and it breaks down by age category, and that way everyone can see where those age categories are currently. And, and just a curious question, have you had any, uh, kids, you know, one, two, three, four-year-olds have had the disease. In intensive care? Any small children, right. you know, under five? We've had, we've had a few cases, uh, I'm not sure it breaks down that low. Uh, I think it's eight and under, but uh, let me get that out to you. Okay. And okay, and one last I question. I have fingertips currently, so. Okay, and one last thing I'd like you to check, uh, Dr. Jones, is I have called from my home phone to the new clinic. If I think it's a 580 or something like that at the new numbers that we have, and it will not go through. And I'm not sure if it's uh, the system here in Tahlequah or the telephone system that handles Jay and Disney area. So um, if you would check, and I'll do some checking around too to see if uh, citizens are able to call that number. Uh, the way we've been able to access the number is call the other number, the, the old number, than having to transfer. So I'll do some checking on that on my own. If, if you don't mind checking on it for me too, I appreciate it. We did have some cell phone carriers that weren't picking up that area, but we thought we got all those corrected, but I'll check with our okay. and see where they're at on that. All I right. do have those numbers. I did pull where I was able to pull them up real quick. So between zero and four years old, we've had 10, 10 cases. Okay. Uh, five to 17, we've had 47 cases. Okay, well that's a big concern. You know, for school starting again, so those numbers are important. Okay, well thank you, sir. Yep. Chief of Staff Inlow. If I might uh, add in to uh, one to address the uh, counselor's question about uh, the phone number system. So that 539 area code is overlays 918, okay. and we've been trying to work with all of the local exchange carriers, so every individual one. They have to put that in their database to say that's a local exchange, so we'll double check with okay. the, the J area uh, to make sure that they've got that updated properly. Um, just as anecdotal, um, Dr. Jones supplied the numbers for the individuals or children uh, with those age breakdowns and the cases we've had, but I will tell you that we've had a couple of school functions recently of. Uh, in the high school age range, and we've seen several positives come out of that. So uh, that is a concern that we have moving forward: is proper being able to properly social distance and have masks when they're around. Thank you, Chief of Staff Inlaw. Yes. Uh, how often is your task force meeting? So our health team uh, meets every Tuesday and Thursday at seven thirty in the morning. Uh, we were meeting daily, and we paired that back, uh, and then uh, now we meet uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, but then there's also a report that comes out every day on the status of cases and, and what we see trend-wise across the United States, around the world, and in particular in the church nation. We appreciate it, too. Thank you. Okay. Anyone have any more questions? <coughs> I have one. Yes. Speak word. Dr. Jones? On the prescription refill center from Three Rivers to Tahlequah, uh, what was the purpose of the move and the cost, and what will we? What's the intent of the vacant uh, uh, space that we have there at Three Rivers? So the the purpose of the move was to be able to expand our uh, our line and, and increase our capacity for the refill center. Uh, 
as you know, the, with, with the COVID, you know, it, it, it made us really look at what we were, had planned this prior to COVID coming, but it really made us jump into uh, looking at how we can keep more people out of the facilities and keep them safer at home uh, and do those uh, refills uh, a little longer extension on them and things of that nature. So when we started moving to more refills, we saw the capacity for our refill center uh, would be easily overran uh, in, in a period of time. So we looked at, we had already planned on moving this, we just didn't, it sped us up on our uh, time frame a little bit. Uh, so by moving it to the TEC building, we're going to be able to expand it, uh, have a little bit uh, more room for future expansion, um, and then also to take that, that square footage that's at Muskogee and turn it into uh, primary care square footage to give us more rooms to be able to see more patients. Uh, that clinic is busting at the seams, so to speak. Uh, they they have been out of wings for quite some time in their primary care, and this is going to allow us to renovate that space and turn it into a primary care area. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from Council? No, Councilor No Fire. Uh, hey, Dr. Jones. Uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember if I've asked this before. I don't think I have, but I know that we you know we received the CARES Act dollars for. Uh, you know what's going on in our health care um, ha have we looked or what are, was our plans in expanding behavioral health I know that depression and anxiety is on the rise because the world we live in today is vastly different than what it was uh, this past winter so we have uh, we have did a behavioral health call line uh, at the same time we did the COVID call center uh, for those patients that anybody had any anxiety or anything that where they just needed to talk to someone did that early on back in uh, I believe it was in March, April area line. Well, I think it was in March. I have to go back and look at the dates when we started that. Uh, we have started renovating some area in the hospital where we moved out uh, uh, some of our primary care uh, facilities to move our Med medication assisted program over to that area. Uh, so we are all looking at ways that we can expand services um, given the, the money that we have to do that. Um, the COVID money is being used appropriately where we can. Uh, there's a lot, there's, you know, that money does have tags attached to it or, or requirements attached to some of that money and we want to make sure we use it appropriately. Uh, and also keep in mind that when we do expand something that we can sustain it past this year. So the COVID, a lot of that money has to be spent in a certain amount of time. And then how do we sustain that past uh, the, the year where we get a lump sum of money? So uh, we're always looking at that and looking at ways that we can expand and ways that we can uh, serve our citizens better, but we also have to be able to maintain it and, uh, and keep it uh, within we don't want to start a service line and then as soon as that lump sum money is gone, we can't sustain that service line and we have to close it down. Uh, that doesn't help anyone. So uh, we're trying to be good stewards of the money that we have and, and uh, make good decisions on, on where that money needs to be spent. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, anything that we can do to, <clears throat> to, to make that more efficient, sometimes I know that I've had uh, Really tough times uh, before COVID on getting um, proper attention to suicide, potential suicide cases. You know, there there is a. It's definitely difficult to be able to get someone seen <clears throat> within a 24-hour window, which is generally the most uh, important time when someone's contemplating those things, or especially a drug rehab. Uh, but anyways, I appreciate your all your work, doctor, and uh, thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, and, and if I can just real quickly comment on that, we do have uh, 24 hour coverage in our urgent care and ER. Right. So, any, I mean, even if it's on weekend or after hours, that's where some, you can send someone or you can get in contact with them. And we have uh, people on call uh, for behavioral health at all, at all times. <coughs> uh, and we are trying to um, do as much as we can to telemedicine. Uh, you know, behavioral health is a lot of face-to-face -face also, right. and so we've had to modify how we're seeing patients. Our numbers have actually gone up some uh, by doing televisits. Uh, yeah. Patients tend to like that, uh, that format a little better uh, in behavioral health than they do in, in uh, primary care. So uh, 
uh, we have been able to make some modifications to open up some uh, doorways in, in that department uh, and use some of that COVID money to expand our technology to allow that. So uh, we're, like I said, we're looking at ways to uh, change the way we deliver care. And from this point forward, we're not at, we're never going to have the same model that we had prior to COVID. All right, we're going to have a hybrid system that's going to have to change with uh, the ability to do distance uh, treatment and, and do a lot of telemedicine, telebehavioral health, things of that nature. So um, <coughs> we're constantly looking at ways we can modify that and be more efficient at it. But it's a learning curve for us too, as well as the patient. Yeah, it's definitely changed the, the face of where I think we're going to do medicine for not just the temporary time being, but possibly long term. I know, do you, will this be able to, or have we looked at, you know, I know whenever you do have a patient that comes in to get uh, detoxed, we could, we could detox them, but getting them lined up to be seen, I know it used to be about a month after we detox them, which typically they can fall right back into the same problem that they were in upon leaving the hospital. Um, is there a way we can get them on a telecommunication rehab program where they're required you know, login time so that way you know, there's an accountability process, it's just a way we can get them somewhat enrolled quicker than, than having them delayed from being seen immediately after being detoxed? I don't know the specifics to it. I have to get with Julie, our director, our senior director of behavioral health, and, and talk with her about that and see how I can get her in contact with you to give you some information on that. Oh, that would, that would be great. One of the things that we run into constantly is as a bed available. So we can have someone ready to go, but if there's not a bed available right. to send them to, that, that creates a problem, but we don't have any inpatient facilities. So, right. Um, so that, that's always a challenge, and that seems to be where our challenge that we constantly run up in. Well, that sounds like a, since it's a constant problem, we at some point need to look at having our own facility to be able to do mm -hmm. it since it's, it's a constant problem. Um, but, you know, I, like I said, I appreciate you looking into it and, and I'd be grateful if you could put me in contact with Julie and, and maybe there might be something there just as far as a temporary measure to expedite at least these uh, rehabilitation parts of drug rehab to be able to get them kind of seen a little quicker or maybe something, just idea hypothesize with her and I really appreciate it, Doctor. And I will mention that we, prior to COVID, we had several uh, Trips scheduled, Dr. Montgomery, myself, and, and some of our health team to go out and look at a couple of different residential facilities with different philosophies, and uh, those all got put on the back burner, of course, when COVID hit. But uh, we were we were exploring that all those opportunities and, and trying to do some uh, due diligence on what what that looks like in the future for us. Uh, but of course, with this pandemic, it, it shut down travel and it shut down uh, those types of Thing that all of our focus went to uh, getting in the spot in the battle on, on the pandemic. Well, appreciate it, appreciate it, Doctor. Appreciate it, Madam Chair. Councillor Smith. Yes, yeah, so my glasses. Uh, we're going to expand our eyeglass outside the boundaries. Is this going to affect the, the backlog on the eyeglasses now for the people that have been waiting six months for glasses? All right, so um, I think you have a proposal coming before you in rules today, and the proposal is to allow, currently in the eyeglass program, you have a uh, situation where you have anyone that's a student, uh, and then you have this area where people are not eligible until you hit the age of 55. So uh, currently with the eyeglass program, unless you have a medical necessity, if you're a student, you get eyeglasses, or if you're over the age of 55, you're eligible for eyeglasses. Uh, and you have this whole group of people that are not. So with the current changes that we're asking for, that you'll be uh, before you at the school today, uh, it's going to allow anyone to come into our, that comes into our clinic and gets an exam in our clinic to be eligible for eyeglasses, for eyeglasses, uh, or an eyeglass voucher to be used. So uh, there's a sort of dollar amount that's going to be attributed to that that we have looked at and we feel like is, is very fair uh, to get uh, glasses uh, at no cost with that voucher. Now if uh, someone chooses to get um, options on their glasses that are, uh, they can have their own cost associated with it. So if, if I chose to get 
uh, tinted glasses or non-glare, then there may be an additional cost that the patient would have to incur for that. But the basic eyeglasses, uh, bifocals, monofocal, uh, even trifocals are going to be covered with that uh, voucher within our facility. And it's going to close that, that gap up of people not being eligible without medical necessity. It also is going to open up the ability for anyone that's a Cherokee citizen, just no matter where they live, if they come to one of our facilities and get an exam, they're going to be eligible for that program. Currently, you have to live within the boundaries, so it's going to open up uh, the door for a lot of patients that weren't able to access our um, Cherokee citizens that weren't able to access uh, that resource or that benefit. Um, so it is at this point, we feel like it's going to be a great service for uh, and take a lot of the headaches off of you guys where you get calls if someone doesn't understand why their relative got glasses, they fit into one of those programs and they didn't. Um, as far as the wait times, we don't feel like it's going to increase the wait times. We've been working with um, Northeastern uh, Optometry School, School of Optometry to uh, make that process more efficient. Uh, we're also looking at other vendors um, that what we can bring in to our patients to allow uh, us to make that process more efficient. Uh, so that's something that's forthcoming. Uh, we have to get this piece done first and then, then that will evolve that efficiency at a time this time. I think it's a good deal for the one day we'll get it. I'm not against it. I'm for it, but we got some that have fell through the cracks somewhere. But I, I'll call you about that. We'll visit. Yeah, if you have somebody specific, I can check on it. Um, you know, one of the things that we ran into also with this, with the COVID is, is the, the optometry also was pulled back, um, you know, with the, as an essential service. And so they got delayed. Their, their uh, lab that makes the lenses got delayed. And then getting those out and getting those to the patients and have the patients come in for their fitting. Uh, got to, if there is there, there has been some delay due to COVID um, requirements and the resources that we had to, to move around to be able to uh, get people uh, keep people as safe as possible. So, um, <coughs> get somebody specific that has an issue, please get them to me, and I will uh, get with um, Nate Lighthizer, who is the director for NSU Optometry, and see what the problem is and see if we can get it rectified. Sounds good, thank you. Okay, Councilor Shambaugh. A uh, quick question, Doctor. Um, Councilor Taylor and myself had a food distribution at Salina last week, I believe it was on Thursday. Their COVID tent had got blown away and damaged in that storm that rolled through. Do you know, and it was very hot because we did it on the asphalt and I know they had their clinic on the asphalt. Do you know if their tent has been replaced yet? I'm, I'm not aware of it being replaced. I know that uh, we have, because of the heat and because of some of the storms that rolled in, we moved some of those uh, tents up closer to the building. Uh, we used them under the awnings. We've allowed uh, staff, we ro we're rotating staff uh, more frequently. Uh, in some cases, staff are waiting right inside the building and then moving out to the, uh, as the cars come. Uh, so we're trying to make adjustments to all that, but uh, I, I wasn't, uh, I was actually uh, off on uh, continuing education last last week, so it's, I'm not aware of the damage that's been done, but I'll check into it and see. All right, thanks, sir. Any other questions from council? Okay, I have just a couple. Uh, Dr. Jones, on the COVID testing, uh, do we call if the test is negative? Do we make them aware that it was negative? And the other thing, are we allowing visitors now in our health facilities? So we are very limited on, bit, on visitors. Uh, if someone comes, let me answer that question first. Uh, if someone comes in and, and they need someone to for assistance with them, for example, a new mother that uh, has a C-section and can't carry a child in and she needs someone to come and help with the children, or a patient that may have dementia or uh, an elder that needs assistance, uh, then we are allowing those, those folks to bring a visitor into the building. Uh, but we are not allowing on a routine basis someone just to bring someone with them into the building. Uh, and that, that is to keep our staff safe and to keep our patients that are, are in the building safe. Uh, 
to reduce the exposure. Um, and there are rules along, that go along with that. So if someone is staying in the hospital and we do screen them and they are allowed to come in, then they are not allowed to leave. If they leave, they're not allowed to come back. So um, we do have some very strict rules to help with our patients and our, um, our staff as uh, we've allowed more, more services to come back into the building. Uh, as far as testing goes, um, what was your question again on, on the testing? Oh, do we call it the test or negative? So we are trying, we were initially trying to call or communicate the negative test back to as many people as possible. Uh, we are now trying to get everyone signed up on the portal. Uh, it became overwhelming. Uh, at one point, our Case McSmith team was, uh, was trying to contact um, over six or 700 people at a time. Uh, and daily trying to contact them to let them have a negative, you know, tell them to have a negative uh, result. So what we have done is we've scaled that back to if you have a positive result, we are going to contact you. If you have a negative, if you do not hear from us, then you have a negative result. The other thing is we are trying to encourage and everyone to sign up on the portal. You can access your own record, you can access your results uh, through the portal and get them quicker than we can call you. Uh, those reports come back from the lab electronically and are automatically put into our electronic health record. So when that happens, that goes through the message center to the physician to notify the person that needs to call you. You can access it through the patient portal and see your record or see that uh, result faster than we can get that information to your doc and then your doc report it so that you can get called. Uh, but it is an order, just like any other test uh, that is ran, it has to have an order of a doc and it has to be uh, reported back. So, um, but you as a patient, if you sign up on the portal and we're getting that information as people go through the drive throughs that was supposed to start this last week, uh, so that people can access their results quicker than, than we can report. And it also takes a little bit of a load off of our staff to uh, all 700 people. Um, so as you can as you can imagine, that, that gets behind pretty quickly when you have that many people. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Jones, I wanted to talk to you about the top three diagnoses by clinics. We have two clinics who, in the top three diagnoses, of vitamin D deficiency. That's an unusual thing, first off, to test for, and then to see it's in the top three diagnoses at two of our clinics. I was curious, uh, why are they testing? I mean, I'm glad they found it in these people and they can, they can receive treatment, but are we seeing an increase in osteoporosis or osteopenia or something during this pandemic? I mean, what caused the, them to even test for vitamin D to make it the top three diagnoses? I can't answer that specifically, but I can, I can tell you that this is, these uh, numbers are pulled out by uh, within a time frame for out of electronic health records, so you may have an influx of uh, providers who orders that uh, routinely uh, and as we had telemedicine evolving and uh, uh, just moving from face-to-face -face visits to uh, the evolution of more telemedicine we have the people who need more routine uh, visits are being seen uh, obviously more consistently than those that are just coming in for um, maybe orphan care or just uh, uh, for a unique problem. Uh, so a lot of people are putting those off. So you're seeing maybe the diabetic being seen more um, because that's something that has to be monitored closer. So those, di so those diagnoses are going to be a little bit skewed for the next uh, few months and the past months because of just the nature of how um, things have evolved and what patients are being seen and what aren't. We don't get a very broad, uh, as, we, as we reduce our services, we're not getting that same broad um, scale of uh, patients that we were seeing before. Or it's a more concentrated um, group of patients that need specific things. So I, I can't answer that specifically as to why it's like that, but uh, that may be skewing our diagnosis a little bit. You know, I can actually understand a vitamin D deficiency if you're locked in 24-7 with this pandemic going, but I just thought that was an unusual thing to, uh, that's not your normal testing. 
And I just thought it was unusual to see two clinics that's in the top three diagnoses, but thank you for that answer. Uh, okay, how many residents do we have in the program with uh, OSU? Uh, let's see, I reported that last time. I think we have 11. 11? Uh, three, four, and four. I believe it's three, uh, fourth, third years, four, second years, and four, um, third. Well, they're going to get some great experience. I'm proud to know that. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, anybody else with any questions? Any other uh, old business? Any new business? Announcements, I have one. I don't know if you've noticed the air conditioning is not working. <laughs> uh, so uh, Gail has informed me that they have contacted a company and that they are working on it today and that at noon they're gonna replace some two of the compressors in this room uh, while uh, we take the lunch break today. And hopefully that will make things better to sit here today. Anyway, uh, if there's no other business, I'll take a motion for adjournment. Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.